Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You understand my Scottish accent? <clears throat> okay, then we can start. It's an awesome blessing to be here with you all. It's a blessing to know your pastor and his wife. <clears throat> and we thank God for them. I, I think of uh, Nehemiah when uh, he was called to build a church, uh, the, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the gates of Jerusalem. And the people joined with him saying, let us rise and build. And he was asked to stop doing it. But God, he said, I am doing a great work. Your pastors have done a great work. And this church, I look around, I've been to many, many, many churches. This church is one of the most beautiful churches Hallelujah. that I've ever been at church building. And this church is here because of the Spirit of God, vision, imagination, and because of the laborers that labor in the work of the Lord here in this nation. So give yourself a clap. Amen. We thank God. You're doing a great work. And uh, I have a word for you today. I believe it's a word of liberation. It's going to change your life irrevocably forever. It's going to change this nation. It has the ability to change the world. Whatever you conceive, uh, receive, you can do anything with that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit in this place today, Father. I thank you that your spirit ministers life to each and every one that has ears to hear. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. God bless you all. Uh, just a little of my background. Uh, in 1980, I came to Christ in South Africa. Uh, my wife and my three children all came to Christ at the same time, January 1980. 1981, or 1980, I moved from Johannesburg to Middleburg. And you know Middleburg in the Transvaal or in Pumalanga. And we started a church six weeks after we came to Christ. Six whole weeks. It's a long time, I know, but you can start building a church the day after. So within nine months, we had over 100 people in the church. The church was growing. Uh, God was doing great things because uh, we, as the word says in Acts 4.20, we could only do that which we had seen and heard. So we had saw the wonder-working power of God, and we went and done what the, the Lord had shown us, and the church started to grow with signs, wonders, and miracles. That church is still there. It's called the Rock Church. It has over a thousand people in every service, and God will use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's, we started a church with two books from Kenneth E. Hagin, 26 lessons in faith and 26 lessons in prayer. I thought 52 weeks of messages, we're going for it. Amen. So I would just read these messages straight out of the books to my children sitting in chairs like this. And my children would say, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. You're not really preaching. You're just reading from a book. <laughs> we want to go and play, Daddy. So uh, starting the church wasn't easy, but it was very rewarding. And that was the beginning of our journey. 1981, God uh, instructed me to start a business. My wife and I <clears throat> had always worked for bosses. 1981, we started our own business. Uh, our friends, many people said that business will never succeed. Uh, my first contract was here in Swaziland. 
uh, to, to build a dam just over here, a hydroelectric dam, uh, uh, build a road, build a rail line here in Swaziland. In the first year, in the first year, at the end of the first year, our net profit was over half a million dollar. Uh, you all rich people in here, so it doesn't, it doesn't make, half a million dollars was our net profit, our gross was over a million dollars. Amen? And I'm going to give you the secret to getting to that place in your life today. Are you interested, interested Bazalwani? Amen? So that's what God did for us. We stayed here to 1987 when God called us audio visually back to Scotland. And 1986 in December the 11th, I was doing a deal in Berlin and Germany. I successfully did the deal. I'm going to tell you the amount of money I made. I made 110,000 pounds on that deal. Today, 110,000 times 22 is quite a lot of money. Amen. So I went back to see my parents in Scotland. As I walked in a, a shopping mall, the Holy Spirit stopped me in my tracks. And with an audio-visual call, he showed me the desperate need of people in Scotland and he said audibly, like I'm speaking now, you're coming back. December the 6th, my sister-in-law said to me, what are you doing this afternoon? I said, nothing. She says, come with me and look at a house. A friend of mine is selling a house. I said, why would I come to see a house for sale? She says, if you're doing nothing, come. As I went to that house, I put my foot on the threshold. The Holy Spirit said again, audibly, I'm giving you the strategy to buy this house. He said to me, tell the, the seller at nine o'clock tonight, you'll phone him with the offer. He mustn't say anything. You put the phone down as soon as you tell him the price. So the guy said, yeah, okay, whatever. So I give him the price at nine o'clock and the Holy Spirit said, you'll phone him back Sunday morning, the 7th at 9 a.m. You've got to be precise when the Holy Spirit talks to you, okay? At 9 a.m., I phone him and he says, I can't take that price. I need another two and a half thousand. I said, right, I'll give you two and a half if you just take all your personal belongings and leave Everything else, the bed, the clothes, uh, everything, knives, cutlery, crockery, everything. And he said, okay, eighth, Monday, Monday the 8th, I went to the bank, got a mortgage, and then called my wife and said, honey, we've just bought a house. <laughs> Which was a surprise to her. We still live in that house today. But I want to tell you, when the Holy Spirit's in charge and you give him complete control over your life, things will happen. But you've got to see it before you can be there. You've got to see it before you can be there. Amen? Amen. So we had a house. At, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story before I go on with the, the message. So we come, I come back to South Africa a couple of days later, go to church on the Sunday morning, my wife and I, when, when, we, when we were in church, we helped build another church. Because of my successful business, we built, partially built the church with our funding, the church foundations and all the earth moving and everything else. That's the business I was in. Um, that day, there was two visitors in the church, and we always asked visitors, like these new people today, we asked them to come for a coffee at our house. So they said, we live too far away. We said, where do you live? They said, this street. I said, well, that's the next street to where we live. So they came, 
They sat in the house. They're looking around. They said, we love your house. I said, do you love it enough to buy it? They said, oh, we can't afford it. I said, how do you know you can't afford it? I haven't given you a price. So the, are you all hearing me? Yeah. yeah. So then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit does great things in your life. He said to me, tell the couple that if they will pray with you right now, their house will sell, which had been on the market for two years without any offers, will sell within two weeks. So they're like, what? So I said, let's pray and agree. Ten days later, they call me and say, our house is sold for the price that we asked for it. Somebody in this place needs to give glory to God. <laughs> it's like, testimony is powerful in the kingdom of God because God's no respecter of person. So we did a deal. We'd sold our house in March 1987. On the 8th of March, we left South Africa to go back to Scotland and start a church in Scotland where we have two churches now. Amen. Amen. When you follow the leading of God, he will lead you into places you've never dreamed of going, you've never thought of going. He will take you places you, that your imagination hasn't even stretched to. Amen. 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 So today, I'm going to speak to you about imagination changing your life imagination changes your life. One of the greatest gifts God has given us is your imagination, the ability to see things in your mind. Many of you are sitting here today, you don't use your imagination. You used your, you had dreams at one time, you were imagining things and then you were disappointed. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 that hope deferred makes the heart sick. It never came to pass in your life, and you said, well, that stuff doesn't work. God put it in you for a purpose. Amen? Amen. The reason you have this gift is because God made you in his image. God imagined, and he imagined the entire universe. God has the foreknowledge of everything that happens in the world today. So you are most like your creator when you are being creative. You are most like your creator when you are being creative. Amen? God smiles on you when you use your imagination for good. He wants us to use our imagination. Everything starts with imagination. Nothing becomes reality until someone imagines it. This building was imagined. Every aspect of this building, the soundproofing, everything, the sound system, everything was imagined by someone before it became reality. Everything man has created was imagined first. Without imagination, you couldn't even make decisions. Without imagination, you can't even remember your past. So say this with me today. Okay. Meditation is the key to ignite my imagination. Imagination fuels my expectation. Expectation is the womb of manifestation. Manifestation is the preview of everything which I will receive in my life. Amen? Amen? So we need to let his word transform our way of thinking and so that we can think beyond that which we know right now. When your imagination is working fully, 
You'll not have a tired day in your life. You will get up every day with expectation of something great going to happen in your life in that day. You'll expect a miracle every day that you get up. You will expect God to lead you and guide you in the way that you should go. You will expect things you've never expected before. So to, it's like you can imagine your future and you can walk into your future. They call it living life in deja vu. You walk into your future, you walk into the dream that you have had or that you're having. Amen? So today is a day of liberation. I want to just give you the, the, the dictionary definition of liberation. Liberation is freedom from oppression. That oppression can be self-oppression. Liberation is the biblical invitation to abundant life and unconditional love. Liberation is ending the structural and systematic injustices that keep everyone from flourishing equally and equitably. I'm in a country right now where I speak to people and they say, we can't do that because of the system in this country. We can't do that because... I'm not going to go into that much deeper than that, but because of the system in this country, we can't get and we can't do, and the economy is so controlled, we can't do it. That is not true. That is where you need, we need liberation between our ears. We need liberation in our thought life. We need liberation in our imagination. We need liberation, the same liberation that Martin Luther King uh, brought in America when he said, I have a dream of emancipation. Amen? Amen. We, we, we've got to get to that place in our lives. Amen? Amen. I, 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 this stuff works. It works. Amen. The word works. Yeah. I, at, at my age of 57... Um, I get dyslexic when I tell my age. <laughs> At 75 years old, I'm not, I, I'm, I, I don't want to sit in a church with people with nodding heads. Yes, pastor. No, pastor. Oh, yes. And you go and you do nothing. The days of doing nothing are over. They're over. We need to do the word. How did my wife and I start the church? James 1.22, we became doers of the word and not hearers only. The last days, the Bible says, the greatest thing that we will have to stand against is the spirit of deception. The worst deception is self-deception. We deceive ourselves. Oh, it's so difficult, Pastor. I tried that once before, and it never worked, so I just gave up. Get a life. <laughs> Wake up. Smell the coffee. Don't look for someone else to, to have an imagination for you. You're the one that God has given creative power to. Come on, church. Amen. This is a, me a message of liberation. I've come here today to start a revolution. Amen. You don't know what a revolution is. <laughs> Basilani, you have to start something. S swivel your head around here. Every one of those empty chairs has a message. No one invited me to church. The message isn't good. There's something wrong. I don't think the word is bringing me life. It's speaking about you. Every empty chair is speaking about you. Lack of enthusiasm and imagination. 
as you walk into this church every week and every day in your prayer, you should imagine every seat filled. This church wasn't built for a few people. This church was built for a multitude. Amen? What well, that which once was shall be again and shall be even greater. When God restores, restores means more. Restore means more. Amen? Amen. So they imagine, oh, I, I, I'll share some other scriptures with you. I've got so much in my heart. But so, my first point, this is my first point. My imagination, say this with me, my imagination Amen. changes my life. Young people, elderly people, no matter what stage you are in your life, I'm still building things. I'm still building. We've come here to Eswatini. We've invested over 300,000, uh, whatever you call them, rand in this project. Already, just this one project. Are you... <laughs> Some of you think, I don't know if I'll ever see 300,000 in my life. That's because you can't imagine it. I did my first big deal. I'm going to keep going back to testimony. My, the first big deal that the Holy Spirit gave me. Okay, every major deal that I did in life was because the Holy Spirit gave me the strategy nudge your neighbor and said, you need the strategy, neighbor. You need the strategy. So that I made so much money. I'd never seen that much money at one time. So I went to the bank and I said to the bank manager, will you take that money and put it on a desk for me? And he says, this is highly unusual. I says, why do you want to do that? I said, I've never seen that much money. So he gets the money out of the safe, puts it on the desk. And I look at it and I say, thank you. <laughs> then I went to the Mint in Washington, D.C. in America so as I could see millions of dollars on a pallet are you, if, you can't have, if you can't see it, you'll never have it. I went to RCCG Church in Lagos with uh, uh, Dr. A uh, Adi Boy and saw, sat on the stage and saw a million and a half people sit before me. He's now built a church three kilometers square. So they could be eight million people in his church. I went to Bishop David Oyudepo's church, had the honor of staying in his home for a week with him, and saw 54,000 people sitting in a church. You cannot see it, you cannot have it. We've got to be people with vision, people with imagination. It's that imagination that will change a nation. There's people in here today that, are, that have the potential of being multi-millionaires. You have the potential of being risk takers, history makers, uh, you'll ch world changers. <laughs> Sometimes I say things and people just go, <laughs> you, <laughs> you have the potential. Amen. It's like, woo! Come on! Or you could just sit the way you <laughs> uh, Charles Spurgeon said to his people, he says in the Bible school, he says, now when you're telling people about the word, he says, be enthusiastic. He says, you've got to let your face and your heart know 
what you are talking about is life so that people will follow that life. So the word says, I, I remember, uh, my memory's still good. We're back in Genesis 11, verse 6. Your imagination shapes your life. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. This is the New Living Testament. Nothing they say out to do will be impossible for them. Three things. Okay, number one, this was the first time that the whole Godhead came to earth. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because there was so much power in what the people were doing. God says we have to interrupt them by changing their language. Are you with me? Amen. So this was, a, this was a negative imagination. The Bible says a lot about negative imagination, but it says more about positive imagination because many people use their imagination negatively. It's called worry. Yeah. It's called concern. It's called anxiety. It's all negative. We're not part of a, a negative body of Christ. We're part of the positive. And so it says the people are united. So the first thing, if you're a business person, you're sitting in this church today, number one, unity of the spirit. Where there's, un where there's unity, there's God's commanded blessing. Psalm 133, where there's unity, there's God's commanded blessing. There's no room in a church for strife. There's no room for gossip. There's no room. If you want things to happen, you've got, if you're in business, you've got to be in business with people that follow instruction. And so the, the, the story of St. Paul's Cathedral being built in, in London, uh, the architect, Wren, goes there and he's speaking to the people that are working there. And this man's wheeling a wheelbarrow full of stones up out of a hole in the ground. And he says, what are you doing? He said to the man, what are you doing? He says, oh, my job is just to wheel this wheelbarrow, dump the stones over there and go back down. And then he speaks to the next man that's wheeling a wheelbarrow up the hill towards, he says, what are you doing? This man says, I'm building the greatest cathedral that the world has ever seen. Amen. Amen. So you have to have unity of vision. Then uh, the, the, the people all speak the same language. I love what you do when you talk about your mission statement and your vision statement. You don't just say it, you conceive it, you receive it, and you believe it. Amen? So it's not just rhetoric, it's something that is changing your life. We speak the same language. When everyone says the same thing, things will start to change. And then nothing they set out to do will be impossible. Nothing. When my wife and I started a business, people said, oh, you'll never make it. That's too big. You're dreaming too big. That in the first year, you always make a loss. In the first year, you'll be lucky if you break even. Well, we broke everything, but it definitely wasn't even. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Because we could see the result. Before we went into business, I had to paint my wife's, how she would see herself in the business. Because a woman's going to say, where's the money coming from? Because we had nothing to start with. You have to work to get man and woman. You have to work together with your husband. Your children all have to work together on this dream for the future. Hey, <laughs> I, I hit a raw nerve there. But anyway, <laughs> it's like my husband would never agree to that. My wife would never agree to that. Well, you got to package it in such a way that they will agree with it. I'm saying stuff here today. <clears throat> Psalm 23, 7, you all know that. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
Wherever your thoughts go, you follow. So as, a, as you think in your heart, that's where you'll go. So if your imagination is great, you will follow everything. When you set your face towards that call of God, when you set your face towards that imagination which has been downloaded in the Holy Spirit, you meditate on it so much, you conceive it in your spirit. No one can take you away from the vision that you've got. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as you think in your heart, so you shall be. As you think, you've got to guard your thoughts. The, uh, the, the word says in Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart with all diligence, for from out of it flows the issues of life. You've got to guard your heart. There's a thief that's out to steal the thoughts and visions that you have. So, say number two, say this with me. My imagination, My imagination. is essential to living by faith. Bishop Dagg, who uh, Pastor Mazabuko uh, referenced just now, <clears throat> I started the journey with him 19 years ago. And 19 years ago, he had one church in Collegano. And uh, he took me to see the, the new church that he was building. <clears throat> and uh, when we walked over that church, he then shared his vision with me and his vision was huge but I want to tell you that thousands of church later and thousands of cathedrals later that vision is coming to pass amen, amen. nothing would dissuade him from the vision and he had two other men Bishop Eddie and Bishop Saki that worked together with him and his wife Reverend Adelaide they all had the same vision. We have got to have the ability to download that vision into the people around us, <clears throat> into our children, into our children's children. Amen? So, Hebrews 11.1 1 in the New Living Testament says, faith shows the reality of what we expect for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. So, what our expectation controls what we receive from God. Amen. Amen. The word of God says in Mark 16, the believer will lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. My expectation was when I laid these hands on anyone, they will recover. No doubt. My expectation is so great in the word of God that people will recover every time I pray for them. Right now, I believe that you're hearing this word and this word is being uh, engraved in your mind and in your heart in Jesus' name. You see, Hebrews 11.3 in the New King James Bible says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. So the things which are seen are not made of visible things. They're made of imaginative things, things that were created in the imagination. Amen? This device, this device was science fiction just a few years ago. Your mobile device has got more power than the first computer. It's got hundreds of times more power than the first computer. The microchip you see, someone imagined that. How do you imagine that? Someone imagines these things before they come into our, our lives, amen? Why can't you be the person? I guarantee you that people that sitting in here have had ideas of doing business and then you've said oh somebody else has probably already thought of that so I'll, I won't do it and you've talked yourself out of doing what God has shown you to do 
Is there anyone here that would say, that was me? Is there any honest people in here that would say that was me? <laughs> yeah, I see hands. Yeah, that's what happens. You talk yourself out of what God has for you. Uh, uh, so these invisible things are what the imaginative power, the creative power God has placed in you so that you will get all he has for you. You know that you, your end was predetermined. Jeremiah 29, 11. How many of you could tell me what that says? To give you your intended end. Amen. The Septuagint translation of the Bible says that God will devise a device for you to get you to your intended end. God will devise a device. God will create a device just for you to get you to. He will invent something. He will give you a creative thought to get you to your, the intended end that he has for your life. Is <laughs> that? Somebody should be running around this church already because <laughs> you never heard that before. He's, he's de God, the creator of the universe, is devising a device to get you to your intended end, the, the place where he in intended you to be. He didn't intend you to be struggling all your life. He intended you to be above and not beneath. He, the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, that, that, that he will daily lead you in triumph in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Church, we need to c catch the word. We need to understand the word is so powerful that when we put it to work, it cannot fail. Amen. Amen. He will devise a divine. Come on. You think, what? Me? Out of 8 billion people, he will devise a device for me. He will create a thought process for me to take me to the place he wants me to be. Glory to God. <laughs> I tell you, this is a liberation message. God, sister. <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody needs to catch something in this place today. I didn't come here for nothing. <laughs> uh, glory to God. Amen. If you, it's like you catch one part. So when I came to Christ, I caught one part of the word that God wanted me to live an abundant life. Jesus died so that we could live life in abundance. He came to give us life and its abundance. Amen. I caught a hold of that. Yeah. At 30 years old, I caught a hold of that. And for f the last 45 years, I've been living that word. <laughs> Even that sister that's yawning, God has got a plan for you. <laughs> Even for those that are dozing in their s half sleeping. God has got a plan for you. Even if you just catch one word, he has a plan for you. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, Two Corinthians 4, 18 in the New Century Version says, we set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. We set our eyes on what we see not what we see, but on that which we cannot see. What we see will last only for a short time, but what we cannot see will last forever. When we get the, the truth of this, you are creating a future for your generations after you. So I've got three generations after me. Amen? So I, I'm creating 
that their future, they are all doing well. I'm one of 10 children. We used to pick our clothes off the pavement in the street. My dad was a farm laborer. He was it's the smallest wage that someone could get as a farm laborer. My mum had to work day and night to, to help supply the food for us 10 children. We lived, in, we lived in poverty most of our lives. So that was the way we were brought up. We, we, we sometimes didn't have meals, but my mother had a dream. My mother had a dream, and be, my dad didn't have a dream. My dad was a womanizer, uh, he was a gambler, he was a drinker, and a brutalizer. He brutalized my mom and he brutalized the children. I was molested by an uncle. But hey, I'm over it. I'm, I'm not living there. I'm not living there anymore. You could, be, you could have been raped by another man. You could have been raped by a man. Or you could, whatever. But you're not living there. You've got to move. You've got to see those things which are unseen and see what the Lord has planned for you already. Amen. It's like, oh, woe is me, you know. I, when I was seven years old, I was molested by my uncle and, and it's left me scarred for life. No, you're not scarred for life. I had a, I had a widow maker heart attack in 2011. Do you know what a widow maker is? As someone, you get a heart attack, you die. Obviously, I didn't. <laughs> this isn't a hologram. So, my heart was scarred, okay? So, every six months, I had to go to the hospital, to the consultant for a checkup. So, after about a year and a half, the consultant says, I'm sending you to another hospital for a, a scan. So I go to the hospital for a scan, and the guy that's doing the scan says, what are you here for? And I'm thinking, duh, I'm here for a scan. <laughs> and he says, I says, why, is there something wrong? He says, I can't tell you, I'll send the, the results to your doctor. So two weeks later, my consultant calls, and he said, I need to see you, so I go back to him. And he says, I'm sending you for a scan. I said, I had a scan. He says, no, I want you to get another one. So he says, when you have that other scan, come back up here. Any doctors here? There will be. He says, come back up here. Yeah, that was a word for someone. So come back up here. I'll go back up, and he's typing. He says, you need to take this and frame what I'm, this letter and frame it. I said, why? He says, the, scar, the scarring on your left ventricle has disappeared. <laughs> scarring does not disappear. <laughs> scarring is there forever. But immediately when I had the widow maker, I went to my desktop, and looked at a heart that functioned perfectly. And I kept that before my eyes. Hey, I'm saying something here. I keep, whatever you keep before your eyes is what will happen in your life. Amen. You can see that it's a difficulty moving around. Not. No. Because my heart is refreshed, it's renewed. Amen. I, I set my eyes on what I couldn't, I had to see something and I set my eyes on my heart being totally healed. Amen. These are real stories. So great, number three, great lives are built around great dreams. The word says in Proverbs 29, verse 18, in the Passion Translation, I don't know if you have it, but it doesn't matter. When there's no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, 
when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss will fill your soul. When you follow the revelation, so that, remember what we said in the beginning, meditation ignites your imagination. So when you follow the revelation of the word, you've got to meditate until you conceive the word. The, many of you have never received your healing because you haven't conceived your healing. You haven't taken it in and you haven't, it's not become a reality in your life. You've got to conceive it the way Mary, when she was told she was going to give birth to Jesus, she had to conceive the living word. Amen? So you have to conceive it to receive it. Amen? You've got to believe it, conceive it, and receive it. Amen? Amen. So let heaven's bliss fill your soul. God wants you to do that. Number four, God's dream for my life is bigger than my dreams. Say that with me. God's dream for my life is bigger than my dream for my life. This, this morning, my mandate is to instigate, motivate you to have a dream that will, that will take you to a place that you've never thought you could ever go. Let me read what it says in Ephesians 3.20. You see, all of us live our life within a mental space created by our unconscious mind. We live according to our subconscious mind. Because of what we let infiltrate our mind, what we let infiltrate our lives through the eye gate, the ear gate, when you're constantly uh, in, uh, involved in different social media stuff and everything. Social media, AI, an example of how AI works, Israel on the 7th of October was attacked by Hamas two days later, two days later. Hundreds of thousands of people are in the streets in every nation's capital in the world with placards. How did they get placards printed within two days? And I'm in Swaziland, that just doesn't happen. But it doesn't happen in the West either. Because AI instigated it. We have to live outside of AI. Amen? Amen. We need that space in our subconscious mind. We can't allow it to be dead space. We've got to fill it with our imaginations. Ephesians 3.20 in the Passion Translation says, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you to accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request. He will achieve instant, infinitely more than your greatest request. If you're not making a request, he has nothing to help you achieve. We've got to make our request. Let your request be known unto God. Ask and keep on asking. Amen? Amen. Delight, Psalm 37, uh, 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When you delight, he gives you the desire so that you will infinitely think greater. Your mo and the next part says your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination, he will outdo them all. For his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Hallelujah. Amen. His, the thing is, you haven't had a wild imagination. Amen. You've got to focus on things which are out there in the future. 
because you can go there. You can go wherever God gives you the dream to be. Amen. Amen. I travel the world. I traveled the world in business, very successful for 22 years in business. Every big deal, the Spirit of God gave me the instruction. Pastor, I don't know if I'm getting through to this, your, your congregation here, but I trust that you are hearing what I'm saying. Nothing is built that is sustainable without your God-given imagination functioning in your life. I talked about going to Berlin and doing a deal. I was working with Malaysian people, a German who was selling a machine and I was broking a machine, okay? So we're in this plush boardroom in Berlin. It was the biggest road recycling company in the world, sitting in this boardroom. And these Malaysian people were talking about this machine. The deal's going south. And the Holy Spirit said to me, go to the bathroom. So I got up, went to, excuse myself, went to the bathroom. I got to the door of the bathroom. The Holy Spirit says, this is what you do. You go back in. So immediately I turned around, went back in, put my hand, and the Holy Spirit says, put your hand across the boardroom table and just look them in the eye. So I go in and I put my hand across the boardroom table and I just look them in the eye. Just like this. <laughs> Two minutes, just like this. They're talking in Malay. And looking at me. And then they stand up, shake my hand and do the deal. Amen. Just like that. Amen. The Holy Spirit will take you places that in your imagination, if you will ask him to open the eyes of your, that's why Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, open the eyes of their understanding that they might see so that they may know what are the riches of the glory in Christ Jesus and what is their inheritance? What is their inheritance? Have you imagined your inheritance? So the, that verse finishes with, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. You've got to change your environment, move away from doubt peddlers, move away from people that pull you down all the time, move away into an environment where people are building you up, where you, in your own home, where you encourage your husband, where your husband encourages you. Create an atmosphere of encouragement. Create an atmosphere of encouragement. Tell your wife every meal's phenomenal. Husbands, speak to your wife, encourage them. Wives, tell your husband he is the greatest provider and he may not be providing right now. But tell him, I'm telling you, don't be satisfied with the status quo. Don't be satisfied with, well, this is the way we do it in Malawi. This is the way we do it in Kenya. This is the places, Zambia. This is the places I've been. Oh, this is the way we do it. Let's do it God's way. Let's do it God's way. Let's do it God's way. Let me just finish with this. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've got lots more points, but I'm going to finish. The dangerous thing is our willingness to accept mediocrity. Because then, with mediocrity, our contentment becomes our place of containment. We get content it's like a frog in, the, in hot water. 
It'll stay there until it's boiled to death because it's content. The Israelites were content making bricks without straw and planting garlic and leeks. They were content in their containment. God never created you to be content in your containment. He created you to be people that would change the world, people that would start from your own front door and change the world, change the church, change your environment. Amen? We've got to uh, just let God's Spirit and God's Word fuel your imagination. If you would study the human body, just study the human body and see how impossible, how improbable that it was that we are uh, creatures of evolution. We're not creatures of evolution. We were fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's womb. Amen. We were fearfully and wonderfully made and put together for God's plan for your generation and the generations to come. So today, as, uh, as we close, um, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 12, I believe it is in the Message Bible, it says, God, your life is not small, but you're living it in a small way. You don't have the message by, yeah. Go to the next verse. Next verse. Next verse. Next verse, speed read. Wrong reference. <laughs> Go and look it up. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. Live open. Let me see if you, the guys at the back there can find that. You're living them in a small way. Live openly and expansively. Live openly and expansively. Don't live in a small way. Live openly and expansively. That's what God wants for his people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Create a vision space in your life. Create a space where you can go and uh, where, where you can be in a place where you're quiet and you can ask God for the vision for the future of your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? Lord, I pray for each and all. Oh, that's the verse there. I'm speaking plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. Next verse. Now go back to 12. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from where? The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. Father, in the name of Jesus, I release an anointing in this place today in the life of each and every person. Father, you're no respecter of persons. What you've done in my life, you'll do in the life of every one of these people, Father. As, as they follow your word, they follow the precepts, they follow the principles, they follow the order of your word, Father. I declare and decree that each one in this place, Father, will have a vision for the growth of the kingdom of God in this, in this nation, that they will have a 
a, a vision for the, and they imagine this place being full of people who are filled with the Spirit and worshiping. They would imagine, Father, the Spirit of God flowing, rolling in here in, as a, in, a, in a cloud from the back of the church to the front of the church. They would imagine, Father, people falling over in their seats because of the power of the Spirit of God, changing lives, touching lives, making lives brand new. So, Father, I thank you that your word, right, your spirit right now is touching lives in this place, that they will never forget this word, Father, but, Father, they will not only never forget it, they will take it and they will study it, Father, so that they will walk and run with that word, Father. And Father, your word says in 1 Chronicles 29, 18, where, where David, after he had given hundreds of millions of, of, of to today's finance dollars unto your kingdom, the people saw what David gave and David said, Lord, keep this in the imagination of your people. So the people started to bring until they were told, stop bringing, there's too much already. Father, I thank you that when your people catch that spirit, Father, that the, the nations of this world will change, Father, because of people that have a, your plan, purpose, and imagination working in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Glory to God. I'll share the second half in the next service. <laughs> so you want to hear the rest? Come again. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I chase you. You don't come in the next service. If you dare come, you sit at the back so that the second group is able to sit at the front. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you give God a hand of praise? Good <laughs> I'm simply translating what you've just said. Amen. Faith must work for you. The reason it will not work for you is because you are focusing and concentrating on the wrong side of the thing. But if you focus on what the word says, it will work for you. Science has not told us how this world came about, but the word has told us. God stood and spoke. There is no magic, is the word. Amen. 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 Let's appreciate our speaker. <laughs> Hallelujah. And thank you for coming. Amen. 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 Give yourself a hand. <laughs> I mean, like we normally say, sometimes you can say, oh, we have a speaker, we have this, we have that. They don't come to preach to the chairs, but to people. So thank you for coming, guys. You are telling members. Amen. MCOP. <laughs>